Welcome back ladies and gentlemen. Today we have a tutorial on power and power grids. And yes, it's going to take all of this to explain it properly. A quick note is that we're going to be starting from the very basics. If you're already an experienced Ani player, I ask you to stick through some of the basics because in the later parts of the tutorial, we'll be going over some more advanced mechanics. First, we're going to start with the very basics. You have two types of power buildings in Ani. One is a producer and the other is a consumer. This manual generator is a producer of 400 watts. This lamp is a consumer of 8 watts. The power overlay, activated by F2, also shows what your circuit power health would look like based on colors. For instance, this wire here is not active. For this very basic example, we're going to spawn a dupe. Old Ren's going to see, hey, we need to power up this manual generator. And then all of a sudden the lamp turns on. Now, as soon as we take Ren off the wheel, the lamp is going to turn off. Voila. This is a very inefficient way to run your power. Because poor Ren would have to stay running on that wheel forever in order to keep that lamp lit. In this next example, we have Ruby, and Ruby's running on the manual generator, but the difference is we have a battery here. You can see while Ruby is running, the battery is charging. But now that the battery is full, Ruby stops running and can go do other chores. And the battery will still provide power. Now you may be wondering, well, how much power is it going to provide? You can see here that the power available is 10 kilojoules. Wait a minute, Echo. You said this thing produces watts. We'll get back to that. First, I wanted to show you all the buildings that are able to produce power. Now, these were built very specifically in this order. And it's so that you can get a quick look and see what produces the least amount of wattage versus what produces the most amount of wattage. First, we have the wood burner. It produces 300 watts and 170 grams of carbon dioxide per second, and it requires lumber. Next, we have our solar panel. The solar panel takes in sunlight and outputs 380 watts of power. Next, we have our manual generator. It requires duplicate labor in the form of a duplicate coming on and running on the wheel, and it outputs 400 watts. Now, you may be thinking that it only outputs 400 watts, but you can also consider that it also outputs carbon dioxide. Because when a duplicate is sitting on that wheel, unless they're in an Atmos suit, they're going to be exhaling carbon dioxide. Next up, we have our coal generator. And you may have guessed it takes coal. Once you put coal in the generator, it'll produce you 600 watts of power and 20 grams of carbon dioxide per second. Next, we have our natural gas generator. It takes in natural gas and produces carbon dioxide and polluted water and 800 watts of power. Next up, we have one of my personal favorites, the hydrogen generator, and it produces 800 watts. But one of the reasons why it's my personal favorite is because it's clean. It doesn't emit any other chemical. No polluted water, no carbon dioxide. It just burns the hydrogen and creates power. Finally, we have the petroleum generator. The petroleum generator is an absolute beast at two kilowatts of power. It also is very dirty though. It produces 500 grams a second of carbon dioxide and 750 grams per second of polluted water. It can take either petroleum or ethanol. Finally, we have a couple of steam turbines set up here. And the reason why I have the steam turbines is because I wanted to highlight the differences in how much power they can produce. They can go all the way up to 850 watts of power. And they output water. In fact, they output the same amount of water as they consume in steam. And here you can see that we have 138 degrees Celsius steam. When I activate this steam turbine using this automation switch, you can see... It'll spin up, and at most, it's producing 350 watts of power. And that's because the temperature in here is only 138. Additionally, if I replace all of the 138 Celsius steam with, say, 105 degree steam, watch what happens. The steam turbine just straight shuts off because the steam in the room is below 125 degrees. 
Now in this example, we have it filled with 204 degrees. We'll activate the steam turbine. Instantly, it goes up to the 850 watts. And that's because the steam in here is hot enough. For maximum efficiency on your steam turbine, you want your steam around 200 degrees. You can see here, I put 190 degree steam, and now our steam turbine is outputting about 770 watts. An important note about these steam turbines, notice that it is putting off an awful lot of heat. At the moment, 97,000 DTUs. So you need to figure out a different cooling method to make sure that these steam turbines stay cool themselves. I also wanted to highlight some of the rocket engines. Rocket engines also produce power. Some of them. But it's important to note that while they're sitting on a planet, they're not producing any power. But when they're flying around in space, well then they do. You can see here, once you go to the tooltip, the thrust generations for the small petroleum engine is 240 watts. How do you tap into that? Well, you can go into the interior of any of your modules and have this awesome power outlet fitting. It's available in the rocketry menu. This power outlet fitting will provide the power that is being produced by the rocket engine and any connected power producers. Now, while the small petroleum engine produces 240 watts while under flight, the sugar engine here only produces 60. The steam engine produces 600 watts. The petroleum engine produces 480 watts. And then finally, the hydrogen engine that produces 600 watts. Note that we didn't mention the carbon dioxide engine or the Radbolt engine. And that's because they don't produce any wattage. Now that we've seen some of the power generators, let's highlight the different types of batteries. There's three basic types. Secretly, there's four, but for the most part, these are the three we're going to be concerned about. You have the regular battery, which has a capacity of 10 kilojoules, but it leaks 1,000 joules per cycle. If this battery was chock full at the beginning of a cycle, by the end of the cycle, it'll only have 9 kilojoules, assuming it has no other consumers on its lines. Next, we have the jumbo battery. The jumbo battery holds four times as much as the standard battery with 40 kilojoules, and it leaks 2 kilojoules per cycle. Which you may be thinking, well, it actually leaks more power than the regular battery. And you'd be right. The difference is the percentage. The small battery leaks 10% of its power per cycle, whereas the jumbo battery only leaks 5% of its power per cycle. Then finally, we have the smart battery. The smart battery holds 20 kilojoules. So while yes, it does hold less than the jumbo battery, it only leaks 2% of power per cycle. The best thing about the smart battery though, is the fact that you can apply automation to it. So the battery will be able to tell the different power generators when to turn on and when to turn off based on how much power it holds. We'll see that in a little bit more detail in a bit. Finally, we have the big Chungus rocket battery module. It holds 100 kilojoules and only leaks 400 joules per cycle, making it the most efficient battery there is, with a total power leakage of only four tenths of a percent per cycle. Now, the disadvantage of the battery module, it has to be installed on a rocket itself, but the great thing is once you already have it on a rocket, you can still tie into it just like any other battery. Finally, I wanted to show you the small solar panel module. It produces 60 watts. Now, we have four types of wire in Ani. We have standard wire, which requires metal ore. Then we have the conductive wire, which requires refined metal. Both of these wires can be built between walls. The standard wire has a maximum load of 1,000 watts. What does that mean? You can't have more buildings on this one line if they're consuming more than 1,000 watts. We'll highlight that example later as well. The conductive wire... 2,000 watts. Then we have the heavy watt wire, which is also built out of metal ore, and it has a load capacity of 20,000 watts, or 20 kilowatts. Finally, we have the heavy watt conductive wire, which can go all the way up to 50 kilowatts, but it has to be built out of refined metal. Now, there's two significant disadvantages of these wires. First, they can't be built through tiles. You have to use one of their joint plates. The second is their horrendous decor penalty. As you can see, the decor right over the wire here is minus 247. 
And the reason for that nasty decor is because the heavy watt wire has a minus 22 and a half decor penalty for six tiles. The heavy watt conductive wire is a little better. Its decor penalty is minus 20, but only over four tiles. All right, I think that's a good enough overview on the equipment that goes into power. Now let's look into its utility. You remember me saying that this wire here has a capacity of a thousand watts. Well, you can see here the potential load is 8 watts, because we have one lamp that uses 8 watts. Over here, you can see the potential load is 24 watts, because we have three of said lamps. The next two pieces of equipment I wanted to highlight to you are the transformers. We have two variants, large and standard. The large will limit power flow to 4 kilowatts. The small will limit to 1 kilowatt. As an example of how these transformers work, we're gonna throw a dupe down and get this battery charged up. You can see once power is being supplied and power is going into this jumbo battery, it then feeds both of these transformers. You notice that these lines are not directly connected. This allows you to put 1000 watts on this line and 1000 watts on this line, and they will not brown out. As an example, you can see here that we have conductive wire, which has a maximum capacity of 2000 watts. If we activate all three sun lamps, you can see we just got overload damage on this wire. And that's because we're drawing too much power on this line. The line itself doesn't control how much power is across it. You can send as much as you want across it. The problem is if you go past its capacity, it will fry. The current load is all that it matters when it comes to circuits overloading. The potential load, you can get as high as you want. And it is just all the power consumers on the line, regardless of them actually consuming power at the moment or not. For instance, you can have a lot of different buildings turning off and on, and in total, they consume a lot more than the 2000 watts. But as soon as some of those power consumers turn on and the current load is over 2000, that's when you're going to overload your circuit. This is the best use case that you will use transformers for. In a, our test example, we have a bunch of hydrogen generators. This is to simulate our power generation for our colony. They are connected to one smart battery. And as described earlier, we have the automation wire connected to the smart battery and it will send out a green signal whenever it gets below 50% of its power. So when it falls below 10 kilojoules, sends out a green signal, and it tells these hydrogen generators to turn on. When it gets up to 95% full, it sends a red signal and tells them to turn off. You may be wondering why we say 95 and not exactly 100, and that's because the hydrogen generators finish their sort of animation cycle, which sends more power. So you gain a little bit of efficiency by setting it 95 and not 100. If we set it to 100, these hydrogen generators will keep charging the battery until it gets to 100%. But once it gets to 100%, a little bit of power is lost when the hydrogen generators finish their cycle. But we're using this as an example of how you can set up your power spine in your colonies. You can see here, our power spine comes all the way down through here. This is to simulate if you had a larger colony and you had a bunch of other places that you needed the large power spine to go down through. And then anytime that we actually need power off that spine, we connect a power transformer. The transformers allow us to segment our power grid. And this is what gives us the ability to run many wires all over the place without browning out our power spine. Now notice that the heavy watt wire that is acting as our power spine still has a current load. And its current load is because of all the transformers connected to it. Eventually, you'll have to keep upgrading your colony's power generation to meet the total power requirements of your colony. Now you may be wondering, well, why don't we just run heavy watt wire everywhere? Well, remember, the heavy watt wires can't go through tiles and they have that massive negative decor. Whereas our standard conductive wires have no penalty. A couple other power equipments to highlight. There's two switches that are available to us. One is the manual switch. All it does is prevent the flow from one side to the other. When we activate this switch, you can see all the bulbs turn on. There's another one called a power shutoff. The only difference between these two switches is this one is not manual and is done by automation. We activate the automation switch, it sends a green signal to the power shutoff, which enables power flow. When we deactivate the signal, 
and send a red signal, it turns the power flow off. Now for the somewhat complicated discussion of joules and watts. The difference between joules and watts can be highlighted this way. This light bulb takes 10 watts. And watts are a unit of power. And power is generally defined as energy over time. So when we say that light bulb takes 10 watts, what we really mean is the light bulb takes 10 watts per second. This is where our conversion into joules comes from. Joules are basically the stored energy. So for instance, this power transformer is fully loaded with a thousand joules. That means it can run a 100 watt device for 10 seconds or a 1000 watt device for one second. We can highlight this example by turning off this switch, which cuts the available power on the spine off here. And we can watch the joules in this power transformer are slowly being drained. The lights are still on and now they go off because the power transformer ran out of available joules. We can turn the switch back on transformer gets fully gets powered back up and now it says hey i have a thousand joules to be able to power things with in the case of our light bulbs we have 10 of them here they're 10 watts each so that's a total of 100 watts so it would drain this power transformer in about 10 seconds so why go through all this complicated mechanics to try to figure out the best way to use power well in our current playthrough we are trying to use just manual generators and where you put the manual generators in relation to the batteries and transformers matter. Right now in our playthrough, we're using a bunch of heavy watt wire just to make it easy, quick, fast, and a hurry. But eventually, we're going to be wanting to just use conductive wire to save that decor cost. And if we check the decor, we can see the decor penalty on this heavy watt wire is severe, whereas there is no decor penalty for the conductive wire. So it's just a little bit of a cleaner way to do it. Here's the problem. Because the manual generators aren't directly connected to the batteries, there's this issue of when they jump off. You can see Turner just jumped off because this power transformer is full. The battery is still chock full, but Turner's still running. We can make this a little bit better by tying in automation wires to the individual manual generators. We'll take these here, and then we'll take this one here. Now, all of these are disabled because the batteries are full. We have this one set on 9070, this one set on 9060. Let's provide some power consumption here. Now slowly these batteries will drain. Let's speed that up a little bit, turning on a second sun lamp. So now our automation says, hey, we're ready for more power. So it enabled these manual generators. Here comes Turner to come run. But even though the battery wasn't charged, Turner still hopped off and honked back on. It's, it's definitely not a consistent source of power. Now we have some dupes running on it. They've gotten the batteries full. So now the batteries have sent the automation signal to disable the manual generators. But there's still this issue with occasionally they just jump off the wheel. And this happens despite the fact that the generators were enabled and the power transformer wasn't full. Long and complicated story short, it's for this reason why I've concluded I'm just going to keep running heavy watt wire and using transformers in the normal fashion. Transformers aren't meant to give power back to a grid. They're meant to take power from the grid. And this is the reason why the dupes occasionally jump off. But because this is so inefficient, I think the best bet is just to run with the heavy watt wire and eat the decor penalty. And here's an example of how that looks. We just removed the transformers. We've put a lot of pixel packs and some diamond aero pots. And now the decor ain't so shabby. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial on the basics of how power and energy work and a little bit about grid management in Oxygen Not Included. And I'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.